let's double yeah. click on yeah. protein source you and i've had some some back and forth on that over the over the years mm -hmm. so i think i have a quote from yeah, you sure, sure. that i thought kind of spoke to this every meal is a short-term investment in how you feel and perform mm -hmm. a mid-term investment in how you look and a long-term investment in your freedom from disease so if we yes, think about the yes. long-term mm -hmm. perspective here how how does choosing where your protein comes from do you think sort of play into that or how do they intersect coincidentally the latest publication i've been involved in is a systematic review on the effects of soy protein on muscle adaptations and and health parameters so uh, i make a joke that at the close of, of of doing that project we can no longer use the word soy boy in a pejorative context <laughs> because it turns out that soy just kind of wins at all kinds of things that's going to be music to the ears of a lot of people and there's going to be a lot of people that hate that and there's going to be a lot of people that hate that there's a lot of people who like to wield the the, the, the soy boy weapon <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I, I mean afterwards we're like oh that this is interesting uh soy protein is better than whey at uh mitigating oxidative stress um lowering lipid peroxides you know uh even improving blood lipid profile. And the concern about soy negatively impacting hormonal status doesn't seem to be there, aside from just a couple of really odd case studies where the isoflavone intakes are about 10 times the norm. And so- And the odd, the odd rat study, I saw Paul Saladino <laughs> put up a- oh God. He he put up a video about soy. Yeah. I had to laugh at this because I, I I don't know that a lot of people in his community fact check the things that he says. He sure. gets a lot. He gets sure. away with a lot. He seems to. Yeah. And and I know there are certain people that sort of call him out, but he he cited this rat study the other week as evidence that soy is feminizing. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, here's you know here's a group of male rats that were fed soy, and there was a you know, a, a and increase in hormone levels and he just kind of left it there and i went in and i thought it's a rat study i don't really care about it we have clinical intervention studies where you feed men soy but i'm interested to look at th what this study did and what they saw and what was interesting is it's, it's very clear it's clear even in the abstract they say the males that were fed this male rats that were fed this soy extract had a reduction in estrogen and an increase in testosterone, <laughs> which is the very opposite of oh, what you would funny. expect to see if soy was causing feminizing effects in there. So his own reference kind of refuted him. Oh but. yeah, that's always a bummer <laughs> when your own reference just does you in like that. But yeah, the, there's been a sy recent systematic review that even subanalyzed the uh, isoflavone doses. And how they affected the these endpoints, um, you know, changes in in testosterone, estrogen, etc. And uh, they subanalyzed doses that were above seventy five milligrams and below seventy five milligrams. And and mind you, it takes a gram of soy protein to rack up roughly a, a, a milligram of isoflavone. So um, even 75 grams of soy protein a day didn't adversely impact hormonal profile or cause, you know, in quotes, feminizing effects. So, um, it's interesting, you know, interesting stuff. Of course, way outperformed soy in, you know, in, in, in a handful of studies for acute anabolic response. So muscle protein synthesis. But then, you know, muscle protein synthesis is just a short-term look at what might happen over time with adaptations to training and, and muscle growth. And uh, there's a couple of studies now, um, the first one being by, by Hevia Lorraine and colleagues where the uh, a soy-fortified vegan um, diet was compared with an omnivorous diet. And there were no significant differences in muscle size and strength gain in resistance trainees who kept protein at 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. And the super interesting thing about that study is that the 
soy supplemented group still had significantly less essential amino acid content. Right, lower uh, leucine intake. Yes. And so we have to kind of say, hmm. Does that matter once you have total protein at a certain level? Right. And of course, the you know the limitation of that study is they use untrained subjects. And so maybe the resistance training adaptations could have masked any advantage of, of the, you know, of whichever group may have had the advantage. Um, but then, you know, the, the study following it, Montaigne and colleagues, they looked at that. I, they had creatine as well, which I know a number of people kind of push back on. I, I, yeah, if, if they didn't, if they didn't include the creatine on that, it would be a little less noise in the, in the sauce there. And it would have been a little more clean study to draw conclusions from, but, um, so are you it's of the view stuff. today that once you have total protein at what you would describe as optimal, so we're hitting that 1.6 grams per kilogram, that the source of that protein, be it from animal or plant, doesn't matter or doesn't seem to matter as much? And can we say that for everyone or is that specific to the kind of like one population? Does that also apply to elderly, for example? Yeah, that's a great, you know, that's a great point. Um, I think we would have to draw those conclusions based on the populations um, that have been studied thus far. So younger adults, not necessarily, not necessarily a, a athletic, um, mildly resistance trained at, at best. And then there's open questions about uh, whether the elderly would do better with animal source protein or with supplemented um, essential amino acids and or branch chain amino acids on top of a pre-existent plant-based diet. So we we don't have that data. I, I would love to see a, a study looking at the RDA for protein, so 0.8 grams per kilogram per day with essential amino acids stacked on top of it. See if that can run with, see how close it comes in terms of muscle growth and preservation with a 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight model. That would be a really interesting study because in acute short-term comparisons, um, there have been some really interesting things seen with the muscle protein synthesis response of essential amino acids dosed at just a fraction of the whole protein um, comparator, even to the tune of, gosh, there was one study showing that three grams of EAAs elicited the same MPS as close to 20 grams of intact protein. There's another uh, recent study showing that six grams of, um, of protein with three grams of EAAs in there uh, was equivalent to, I believe it was a 17 or 18 gram dose of, uh, of protein in terms of uh, same MPS. So, um, and actually the 12, a, a 12 gram dose of, um, six grams of EAA plus six grams of, uh, whey protein actually outperformed an 18 ish gram dose of, uh, whey protein in terms of muscle protein synthesis. So a lower total amount of nitrogenous matter, but, um, enriched with essential amino acids actually elicited a higher muscle protein synthesis response. And somebody asked me, me this the other day. They're like, are there any examples of non-animal proteins having a stronger anabolic response than animal proteins? And to date, I can recall a couple of examples, very esoteric stuff. So there's the famous Babalt at all P protein study that showed greater muscle protein, uh, uh, greater muscle thickness over a longitudinal period than, than whey supplementation. That's one. And then the other one is the, the emerging mycoprotein studies showing greater MPS than milk protein. Which is what Montaigne said. That's a Montaigne thing. And so um, there's interesting stuff <laughs> coming out of that. Um, but still, uh, to circle back to the question you asked, I still think we need to be a little bit skeptical.